Hello class. Before Easter break, I had asked that you um, take a look at this lecture and complete a Google form. Uh, I was having some issues uh, recording this lecture last week, uh, which is why uh, I'm posting it uh, in the second week of spring break. Uh, I still ask that you take a look at this lecture as well as complete the Google form um, that is to follow. Today we're going to be talking about a new process of cell division. All right, so we're still talking about cell division. You're going to really have to remember and review uh, the process of cell division that we talked about, known as mitosis. All right, we talked about the different stages of mitosis. Today's new form of cell division that we'll be talking about rhymes with mitosis, but is very different. It's known as meiosis. Notice its spelling. All right, meiosis is related to sexual reproduction. Uh, we're going to be talking about the process of meiosis, how it's similar to mitosis, and how it's importantly different than mitosis. You're going to be able to be uh, describing in the Google form uh, how meiosis and mitosis are the same and how it's different. So let's take a look, uh, with beginning with a, uh, a quick analogy. All right, the first question that I want you to answer on, you, on your Google form, now you can take notes as we're going along here. The first question is, what happens if you try to add a glass of water, a full glass of water, into an already full glass of water? Let's model it really quickly. So let's have our two glasses of water, and we're going to add them together with an addition sign, and here we have a full glass of water and another full glass of water. Let's fill that water in. All right, so we're visualizing. If we were in class, I would actually be demonstrating this in front of you. So imagine we have two full glasses of water, and we want to add this glass into the next glass. Uh, take some time, pause this lecture, and come up with an, a, a response. Hopefully you've paused uh, and, and written down some of your responses. I think the answer is pretty clear, though. If you take a full glass of water and pour it into another full glass of water, you're going to spill. You're going to overflow. Uh, not, or all of that water can't fit into one single glass. Question is, what does this have to do with cell division? What does this have to do with sexual reproduction? Well, let's imagine, then, that our glass of water is a cell. Right? And the water itself, inside that cell, is all the stuff inside a cell. Remember, we did a similar kind of demonstration uh, a few weeks ago in class when we talked about mitosis. That if we wanted to, uh, that, that all of the stuff inside of uh, a cell, all of the organelles, all of the uh, uh, cytoplasm, all of the DNA and chromosomes, all of those things had to be duplicated before we could divide and come up with an identical cell. Now, if we're preparing for sexual reproduction, sexual reproduction takes a sperm cell and an egg cell and combines them, just like we try to combine our glasses of water. However, if the sperm cell has a, a full set of chromosomes, remember that human beings have 46 chromosomes. So if a sperm cell had 46 chromosomes and an egg cell had another 46 chromosomes, we have full sets of chromosomes just like that full glass of water. If we add those two full glasses of water together, we're going to overflow. Okay, and we don't want that. Uh, imagine that, uh, that new zygote that is created, that new uh, living organism that's created, adding 46 plus 46 chromosomes, you're going to get 92 chromosomes, which is much more than a normal human cell has. So now you have to ask yourself, what does a, uh, a, a sex cell, a sex cell like an egg or a sperm cell, what does it have to do before they need to combine? All right, think about that for a second. Uh, you might have to answer a question like that in your Google form. Well, if we want to create a cell that has a full set 
of chromosomes, a full set of DNA that has 46 chromosomes. Well, that sperm and egg cell, those two cells cannot have the full set. In fact, what needs to happen is each of those cells, the sperm and the egg, have to cut all of its information in half. All right, so we have a half full cell or a half full cup of water and another half full cup of water. And now when we add the half full cup to the another half full cup in sexual reproduction, now what we result in is a full cup. Okay, well, that's a terribly spelled full cup. Okay. That is to say, during sexual reproduction, or rather, in preparation for sexual reproduction, the cells that are involved in sexual reproduction must be divided once more. Just like in mitosis, we divide cells and we come up with two identical cells that have a full set of information. In meiosis, which prepares a cell for sexual reproduction, the cell needs to divide once more to cut all of the information in half so that each cell, instead of having 46 chromosomes, now has 23 chromosomes. And 23 chromosomes. All right. Again, this is the process that helps cells prepare themselves for sexual reproduction. All right, take a look. If you have a man or a male and a female and their sexual organs, the testicle and the uh, ovary, those things are the, uh, the organs that are producing gametes, which are sex cells. All right, the sex cells being the sperm and the egg. Okay, and we need those gametes, this egg and this sperm to have half of the genetic information. Okay, we need it to have 23 chromosomes so that when we add the egg or to the sperm, or rather the sperm to the egg, and we are, have fertilization, we create a zygote that has 46 chromosomes. Okay. Now we need to create these gametes in a special way, not through mitosis, but a process known as meiosis. We're going to define that in a second. Let's simply uh, define meiosis as the process of forming gametes, which is to say the process of forming gametes or sex cells that have half the number of chromosomes as all other somatic cells or uh, all other cells in the body. Again, we're doing this so that when the sperm and egg are fertilizing one another, we create one zygote that adding one half plus one half the amount of genetic information is one full set of chromosomes. That is to say, 46 chromosomes. The next question that you're going to be answering uh, in your Google form is, what do cells then, if they're going to have half of the information, need to do to prepare for sexual reproduction? And so that the new cell that they're creating is not overflowing with chromosomes or genetic information. What do those cells need to do? Pause the lecture and answer that question in your notes. Hopefully you've paused uh, and come to the conclusion that instead of just dividing once, like in, myo uh, in mitosis, in meiosis, cells have to divide twice. And in fact, we're going to take a look uh, at those, or, or at that two, or, or, or a division that takes uh, uh, two kinds of divisions uh, to complete and form half the, uh, the amount of information or genetic information in a cell. Before we take a quick look at meiosis and the process of meiosis, we're going to define a couple more terms. We keep talking about cells that have a full set of information and cells that only have half uh, of that information. We're going to give those cells special names. 
A cell that has two sets of chromosomes, remember we talked about homologous pairs, and we have 23 pairs of chromosomes to give us 46 chromosomes. A cell that has 46 chromosomes, which is to say two sets of all of the homologous pairs, is known as a diploid cell. Right? It is a cell that has two sets of chromosomes. Most of our cells are diploid. All of the somatic cells in our body are diploid cells. So all of the cells you normally think of as cells, like skin cells and brain cells and liver cells and kidney cells and blood cells, all of those cells are diploid cells. However, cells that are produced in meiosis, that is to say, our sex cells, all right, they need to have half of the genetic information. It is known as a haploid cell, or it's a cell that has half as many chromosomes. Only one set of those homologs are in haploid cells. So cells at the end of meiosis are haploid. They only have one set. Instead of having two chromosome number ones and two chromosome number twos, and instead of having two sex chromosomes, they only have one of every pair of chromosomes. They have one of every homologous pair. So let's take a look at meiosis. Meiosis starts with a cell, just like any cell. All right, and this cell that we're looking at here, it's, uh, it's a diploid cell. It is a cell that has a homologous pair. It only has two chromosomes, however. Okay, two chromosomes. It has a maternal chromosome and a paternal chromosome. Okay, let's just imagine that red is maternal and, and blue is paternal. And just like in mitosis, in meiosis, there needs to have, uh, we have to duplicate all of that information. So we see duplicated information, but we still have two chromosomes. All right, those chromosomes now are duplicated. Remember that each chromosome has a chromatid. Okay, and we still have uh, our, our diploid cell. But after, uh, as you can see in meiosis, we have one division where we split uh, those chromosomes in half, and then we have a second division where we split chromosomes in half again. And what we result in, we see that we have four cells. And each of those cells has one chromosome. That means that we start out diploid and we end with haploid cells. And how many cells do we end up with? Well, we end up with four cells. Each of those cells are haploid with one chromosome. So the next question that you should ask yourself is what is the difference between the cells at the beginning and at the end of meiosis? Why don't you pause, take a quick look back at that diagram and answer this question. All right, well, again, we can take a look at these cells at the beginning and at the end of meiosis. All right, one thing that we see at, uh, in meiosis is the beginning cells are always diploid whereas the end cells are haploid, which is to say we have two chromosomes to start in this cell, and we end with one chromosome, if I can spell properly. That should be a C. Okay, and ultimately that's the main difference. Uh, we start with one cell, and we end with four cells. That's another difference. Okay. Those are differences between the beginning of and ending of meiosis. And again, this is happening in all of our sex cells. So it's happening with our sperm cells and for females uh, in their egg cells. Something very special and different happens, however, in meiosis that I want, us, I want, want to bring our special attention to. Notice here in this cell, what we're looking at, we see a homologous pair. However, if we were talking about mitosis, we'd see those two chromosomes to be lined up along the center of our cell. 
we'd see them lined up against along that metaphase plate. That's not necessarily the case here. What we see is that this homologous chromosome is not lined up, uh, or these homologous chromosomes are not lined up uh, end to end. They're actually next to each other. Right? That's a special characteristic of meiosis, and we're going to take a look at that in a second. So again, in mitosis, what we would see if a cell had four chromosomes like this cell has, instead, uh, what we would actually see, what we would expect to see, is all four of those chromosomes being lined up along the center of the cell, along the metaphase plate. But we're going to erase that, because that's not what's happening here in meiosis. In meiosis, we form, uh, or, or chromosomes form, tetrads. All right, tetrads are really important here. Let's take a look. A tetrad is a homologous pair that's connected to one another. So if this was a chromosome number 19, for example, bef uh, during the process of meiosis, the maternal chromosome 19 and the paternal chromosome 19 would form and bond next to one another. That's really special and different about meiosis, is the formation of tetrads. Right? The homologous pairs form uh, uh, a connection next to one another. So, for example, if we had four chromosomes, that means we would have two homologous pairs. One of those uh, homologs would be the maternal, the other would be the paternal. And so we'd have a tetrad forming here and a tetrad forming here. We'd have two tetrads instead of four chromosomes along the metaphase plate. And what's happening here is we're doing this in, uh, so that the new cells, the daughter cells that are resulting, have half of the genetic information that has, that means it has one of every homolo homologous pair. So every new cell is going to have, let's say, a chromosome A, and a chromosome D. We don't want a cell to have two chromosome A's and a cell to have two chromosome D's because if that were to happen each cell would have a different amount and different kinds of DNA. We want it to have the same kind of DNA just split in half. That's why we have to form tetrads so that we split all of the homo homologous pairs exactly in half so that every new cell has one homolog of each pair. So now we can take a look at the stages of meiosis. We're ready to do that now. And what we'll notice is that many of these stages look almost identical to the stages of mitosis. We spent a lot of time talking about the stages of mitosis so that we could uh, move quickly through the stages of meiosis. Keep in mind, though, that there are two divisions in meiosis. We need to divide the cell twice. So we're going to call the first division meiosis 1. Right. In meiosis 1, we're going to be separating homologous chromosomes. We're going to be moving from a diploid cell, if I can spell properly, to a haploid cell. That's our, our goal in meiosis 1. We're moving from diploid to haploid, and we're going to uh, monitor that as we move forward. So in interphase, interphase is much the same uh, as mitosis. All right, we have chromatin, uh, that jumbled or uncoiled uh, DNA and, and nucleus. We've got our centrioles and so on. All right. In prophase one, that means the first prophase happens much the same. We have uh, chromosomes condensing and, and, and coiling up. We have uh, centrioles and spindles forming. We have nuclear membranes uh, 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 decaying. But again, the important point here, tetrads are forming. Notice these tetrads. We have one two, three tetrads, that means we have six chromosomes. All right. Six chromosomes mean that this cell is diploid, D for diploid. Okay. Metaphase, we have those tetrads forming uh, along the metaphase plate. All right. So that's very similar. However, keep in mind the difference between the tetrads and the homologous, pair, uh, the homologous chromosomes. We still have six chromosomes in our cell. Ask yourself, is it haploid or diploid? 
Well, you can tell yourself that this is a diploid cell. There are still six chromosomes. We still have maternal chromosomes and paternal chromosomes in the same cell of each chromosome. During anaphase, now we take those chromosomes and we take those homologs or the homologous chromosomes and we separate them. All right, keep in mind that this chromosome is still a doubled chromosome and this chromosome is still a doubled chromosome. Those doubled chromosomes, those, those homologs, are now separating in anaphase 1. Uh, you could actually say that at this point, uh, these new cells are going to be forming. Here's going to be a new cell, and here's going to be a new cell. These new cells each will have three chromosomes. And so you can now say that this is uh, on its way to becoming a haploid cell. All right, so in anaphase 1, we see the formation of two haploid cells, each having three chromosomes. Let's take a look now at meiosis 2. In meiosis 2, again, each cell, take a look, take a close look, we have one, two, three chromosomes. All cells now, from this point forward, have three chromosomes and as a result are recognized as haploid. Notice that we have two haploid cells because we've just divided uh, that one cell into two. So where this is happening twice. So in prophase two, we still see the same sorts of things. Centrioles, spindles, uh, nuclear membranes, and so on. We're just dealing with haploid cells. Haploid cells. All right, and now, now those chromosomes with, with two chromatids are still lining up along a new metaphase plate. This is metaphase 2. Okay, metaphase 2. Again, we're still haploid and haploid. And those chromatids now separate in anaphase 2. All right, and now they become chromosomes, just like in mitosis. Okay, so we're forming two new cells here. All right, and again, each of those cells will have, uh, will have three chromosomes. Each cell will be haploid, haploid, haploid and haploid. And so after telophase and cytokinesis 2, we have four cells, and each of those four cells has three chromosomes. That means each of those cells is haploid. And that's the end of meiosis. Now again, this seems like a very simple process, but again, remember the process is important because we're dividing the cell twice so that we form haploid cells that have half of the information uh, as the original uh, parent cell. This is really different than mitosis, and so we're going to fo focus now in the next couple slides on coming up with similarities and differences between mitosis and meiosis. So I want you to think, uh, answer on your Google form, and write this down in your notes. How is meiosis the same as mitosis? When you're thinking, I want you to come up with three similarities. Okay, come up with three similarities that can have something to do with the stages uh, of each uh, process. It could have something to do with the purpose or the function of each. All right, but I want you to come up with three similarities. It might have to do with um, the, uh, the stuff. I'll just call it the stuff. The raw materials, the things that we're using. Right, what's this? What's similar here? What's the same between meiosis and mitosis? Okay, so come up with three similarities. Why don't you pause and think about those for a second? After you come up with three similarities between meiosis and mitosis, now I want you to ask yourself the question: How is meiosis different than mitosis? Okay, now again, I want you to come up with three differences. And those differences can have something to do with the number of chromosomes. It could have something to do with... Uh, now, when we say number of chromosomes, you might say something between haploid and diploid. Maybe you're talking about the difference between parent and daughter cells. It might have something to do uh, with the number of divisions... Uh, I'm going to put a dot, 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 because I can't fit it in there. Uh, it might have something to do, uh, let's say, with the formation of tetrads. 
Yeah, you can barely read my writing here. Okay, the formation of tetrads. Uh, it can have uh, something to do with uh, all of those things or something even beyond those things. I want you to start thinking about the differences between meiosis and mitosis. And finally, what I want you to do now in your notes, you're not going to be able to do this in your Google form, but I'd like you to create a Venn diagram. We should know what a Venn diagram looks like. You're going to have two circles, all right, and that's one of those circles will be labeled mitosis, and the other circle will be labeled meiosis. And obviously what's going on in here, you're going to put what's what only mitosis uh, possesses what characteristics mitosis possesses on the outside circle here, okay, and then the uh, characteristics that only meiosis possesses in the outside circle here, and then the inside, you're going to be putting uh, characteristics that they share. So you're going to put similarities here and differences on the outside, okay, uh, and that wraps up our discussion on meiosis and mitosis and the differences and similarities between them. Again, I'm going to ask you to fill out the Google form and submit it before class uh, re resumes next week. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me, uh, and I will be do my best to answer those quickly. All right, I'll see you guys next week, uh, and enjoy the rest of break. Bye-bye.